Hi everyone, I'm Selena for Who is Jesus Today? And who is Jesus today? I'm asking this question by fellow citizens of the world. You know, I've been thinking too. I, I got this in my mind today. Um, to better understand who Jesus is, uh, it's also good to get an understanding of those who oppose him. Back in the day and the time when Jesus walked uh, the earth and did his ministry with his apostles, um, and also today now, and here we are in 2023, right? We all can agree with that. Uh, well, maybe not quite all. But anyway, who is Jesus today? It is good to also understand um, who actually opposes who Jesus is in general and his mission and so as you know on this channel I do not just speak to the Christian community although I do speak to uh, the Christian community and I want to have God's love in my heart for the body of Christ which I belong also as a member but I also belong to all of you around the world because you know why? We are one humanity and we share that. Regardless of our beliefs or walks in life or status or educational level, we do share one humanity. We have that in common. So that's why I speak to all of you, regardless of your background or beliefs. You may come across this a channel and say, oh yeah, well, she seems like she might be a nice woman, but I'm not interested in anything she is saying or believing. It's okay. You're on your journey too. Maybe you don't want to listen to me today. Maybe you'll want to listen some other time. I don't know. But today, anyway, I'm going to talk about um, a common topic in a well-known book in the Bible, in the New Testament. And I will refer also to the Old Testament some, but I'm going to be in St. John, the fourth chapter. So if you want to follow along at any time, you can also get out your Bible and walk with me through St. John, the fourth chapter. So I'm going to try and, oh, I want to try and make this um, as, as, as very uh, concise, but condensed as possible. I will be using also some paraphrasing when I refer to uh, scriptures and that simply also saves time but it's okay to paraphrase as long as you say that you are paraphrasing and you don't want to add or, or take away from the text you know so I'm not going to add or, or take away what I will be doing is saying some things in my own words that are in the Bible in St. John the fourth chapter you can follow me but most of the time I will be speaking verbatim from the exact text text um, I may uh, say uh, take out a portion of that text in my speaking but always refer for yourself to the scriptures and you can find this in the chapter uh, the fourth chapter of St. John so before I talk about also who is Jesus and who is Jesus in this chapter and this encounter with the Samaritan woman, for those of you who are Christians, you are familiar with this chapter. And I wanted to know how did God want me to present this story to the world? And I didn't want to just, I have been so blessed by many speakers and preachers and teachers who have taught about this a, a chapter and coming from um, a different perspective but really the same message and that is really possible so um, because you know why uh, God loves us all he uses people in different ways to convey his truth one truth but can be conveyed in different ways so I'm going to begin this chapter and and this a story in a way that I never really have before and you know I want to focus on the Pharisees okay and I, I feel like sometimes that might be a missing piece to the layers of understanding better the narrative 
of who is a Jesus then, now, and forevermore. Because um, sometimes when we just miss a, a particular aspect, we don't, it doesn't always come together and, and mesh as well. And so who were the Pharisees? Well, they are a, a, a back in the day, a, a Jewish social movement and school of thought. So I've come across this with some more deeper uh, research. I've been hearing about Pharisees for most of my life. And I don't think I've always put a lot of focus on Pharisees. But I did sense that Jesus and the Pharisees didn't quite blend. It, 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 uh, there wasn't a strong connection there. And we'll find out more why if you don't know already. So we know that they are Jewish, so is Jesus, okay? But they, this is a social movement, and it's a school of thought, and it's in the Levant, you know, the, the southern Levant. That's not only Israel, but the countries that are in the area. You have a Jordan, you have Lebanon, okay? So they are in the Levant during the time of the second a temple in 70 CE. I won't go into that, but you can find all this information. It's it's out there. It's in the encyclopedias and it's online. Okay, so there are a Pharisaic group of people, and also the Pharisaic um, beliefs did become the foundational basis for the rabbinic uh, Judaism. I, okay, I'm going to get that out. So, basically, it seems that the rabbis, I would say even of today, based some of their structural uh, a teaching, based on the Pharisees, okay? And so, remember, they represent a social, say, movement of thought during the time of Jesus. But also, um, it is incorporated uh, their uh, belief system into a rabbinic Judaism. Okay, so now they were considered, okay, to be good at Jewish law. They were the, the ones that were supposed to be really upholding the law, really holding out on following the law. This was kind of a conflict with uh, Jesus, and I will explain why. So, God could be, they felt that God could be worshipped away from the temple. So even though they felt they were upholding the law, they, had a, they were like more of a, a newer social train of thought. They felt that God could be worship away from the temple, outside of also Jerusalem. A worship was not a bloody sacrifice. As you know, I have referred before on some a teaching about how uh, the animals were slain and why. Because of the shedding of the blood. The blood was that uh, temporary atonement, a cleansing. So they weren't really all for that. This was a practice, as we know, those who you are also familiar with the Old Testament and the Bible, it was practiced by the priests, which would be the Levites. So these are religious people. They just have a different train of thought of doing things now. Prayer and Bible study, prayer, and uh, the study of the law is how they felt they would be able to live out righteously, righteously in their day. And these are religious uh, people, very familiar with the law, not opposed to prayer, and not opposed to believing in God. So why do they have such a problem with Jesus, why does he rub them the wrong way, his style of ministry, and just who he is? 
So, you know, there's a problem that Jesus would confront. And I won't go through all of that. You can read throughout of the New Testament. And you'll see. A big problem, and a big problem with most people that uh, often cling to a religion and uphold rules and regulations, the problem occurs that we have a hard time really holding out and keeping them and really upholding the traditions of these religions. And even when we do, sometimes it's done out of, say, duty as opposed to really heart affection. So the uh, Pharisees, like all of us who have a religious mindset, like to follow rules and not really mess up. Okay? And we want to follow out these rules with good intentions. A lot of times with really good intentions. The problem is for all of you out there in the Christian community and the world is that we fail and we consistently fail with trying to not mess up and you know one person's mess isn't another person's mess so you may say well I don't have uh, I have control over how I spend my money I'm not a gambler I don't splurge I don't have a substance abuse problem but maybe you can't stand your neighbor and you don't know why you just got something against them and you're struggling with it you know it's not right because the law in a way is in us you realize you know based on the law you know this is not right so Jesus he kind of you know he points out to let you know that what you're doing you're washing your hands you're cleaning the outside, but your inside isn't clean. Uh, Jesus is letting you know, you know, you can pat yourself on your back because I haven't killed anyone yet. But here's the problem. In a way, you have because you hate your uh, brother without a cause. You're hating people, and, and there's no reason. You are a murderer. Ah, uh, I love my wife, I'm home, I support her, the family, I pay the bills, um, I've never cheated on my wife, I've not committed adultery. Oh, but here's, here comes Jesus now. Okay, well, you know what? You've lost, right? Can you even count, I'm saying, can you even count the times? Okay, you look, look upon a woman to lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. So imagine if you are a Pharisee or any kind of religious person that really likes to function in religiosity, this becomes problematic for you. It becomes even offensive the way that uh, Jesus lets us feel like, hey, you think you're okay, you've done a great job, but you really haven't done that. And you know what's really interesting? We learn about uh, Jesus and the woman that he meets, this famous story, the Samaritan woman at the well. It's that it, it appears that he is more softer on this type of person who is, it's known out there that she's not doing some things right. But the ones that feel they got it all together and that they got it down packed in the law and they pray and they fast and they do everything that's right, Jesus goes and he digs into the interiors of the heart and the intention and says, no, you don't. No, you don't. You got it right on the outside. It's, it's, it's a show. But you see, God looks at the heart, and we'll find out why a lot more. Now, a Jesus is on a, a stroll, a walk, okay? In chapter 4, a Jesus had to go through the region of Samaria. He entered near Sakar. And this is near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. The story of Jacob and Joseph is in the book of Genesis. This is why as this is known as a Jacob's 
well. Some of you are very familiar out there with Jacob's well. Here he meets a Samaritan woman. Okay, this is a story that I have heard taught in some ways that are very inspiring for us as women. And I like that. And so um, I do want to highlight the relationship that is unique that Jesus has with women. And particularly women that maybe society is saying they're not so great. These are not like the nice girls, you know. Not, you know, so, you know, he has this encounter with a woman at the well. And I want to make this applicable because the title of this is that, you know, how she's rejected by the society, but she's accepted by Jesus. And so, to my fellow sisters around the world, us uh, women, we can think how there are are stigmas that are placed on us historically for sometimes doing things that are not considered right within our society and they are are not right but how we are judged condemned stoned and rejected you can make that also applicable to your life okay if you out there and you know that sometimes you have you have done things that were not accepted by friends and family and you would say not accepted by god because you do know god but you know and instead of being stoned by Jesus, he actually will sit down and have a conversation with you the way he did with this woman at the well. This was a, a conversation that was never supposed to really happen based on the circumstances. Let's find what, out why. Let's find out who are Samaritans even today. Who are Samaritans? So they are said to be a nearly extinct because there's not a whole lot of people around today from my research who could identify directly with this group called Samaritans. Um, they do a claim to be also say related to the Israelites of ancient Samaria who were deported by the Assyrian conquerors. You learn more about this, the say Assyrians in the Old Testament, but I will go through some of that with you as well. And um, they also though trace their lineage back to the Israelites that Moses led from slavery in Egypt. That's a key point right there. They're tracing their history directly back to the people that Moses led out of of slavery in Egypt. If you recall and you find in the book of Exodus that there were uh, Jews that were slaves in Egypt and they were freed and led out because of say Moses taking a stand with God and doing what God had called him to do. He was not the deliverer of the people. It was you know, Yahweh okay, himself. But he was a tool that God had used the way God is using people today like you and me and say millions of others so they are a part of the kingdom of Israel and that is the northern a kingdom as well so they are they are feeling like they are an outcast or a separate group from just actual of Jews because they also feel they have been made to feel that way. So based on some of the history they were considered to be half-breeds. So somewhere it happened in history that they weren't like fully a part of Jews. Like a separate group, like an outcast. Any of you out there who are say knowingly of mixed race and heritage um, and I do as well when I say that I mean more say currently so between my parents and grandparents then you also can relate to sometimes the sense of not fully belonging the way you want to belong or the way maybe society says that you should you know, belong but first of all I want to say 
and foremost, you belong to whoever you belong to, and that is your mother and your fathers and your grandparents and your history. Whether you are accepted or not, one thing we know that Jesus accepts us just as we are. So if you're feeling like you are an outcast, if it's not because of your, say, ethnic roots, maybe it's because of just your, say, family history, or how you were raised, or maybe because of the issues where you are living, of social economics and classism, it is so easy for us to feel like we don't fully belong someplace. But I want to say, we'll see how a Jesus really uh, connects to this Samaritan a woman when he, he, he wasn't really supposed to. Okay? As I say, this encounter was not supposed to happen. So I want to say that the Samaritans, they they built their own temple and they became more say separatists from the Jews of the day now by the time of Christ okay they were not the best of friends with the Jewish community and vice versa and so their identities are really separate though the Samaritans are tracing their roots back also to Israel and to Moses being the one that led them out of Egypt. They believe in a monotheistic God. The Samaritan woman also is a religious woman as well. She may have a particular lifestyle that's not approved of, but she is a religious woman woman. This is what it means to be a Samaritan. So there was a divide though between Jews and Samaritans. And when there are cultural divides, ethnic divides, and say racial divides, even linguistic uh, divides, and classism uh, divides, okay divides, there comes the issues of avoidance. There's avoidance issues and it can be really intense depending on the time and history and the group of people that we are dealing with so the Jews I've come to find out would actually cross the Jordan River rather than travel through Samaria let's make this applicable for t for uh, 2023 is there any place in your town uh, where to keep from being, uh, to keep from a crossing paths with a particular neighborhood or region or people group, you will go way out, <laughs> way around town just not to go into that region or that neighborhood. People do this all the time. So it's not so odd to think that the Jews would go, would cross. Uh, it says so. The Jews would cross the Jordan River rather than travel through Samaria. Sometimes people will drive, uh, uh, say, an hour or more, right, just to get around a particular region or community. Sometimes we understand why people have concerns, right? But let's make this applicable to our world here. In the 21st century this still happens but Jesus is a different kind of Jew obviously because unlike what Jews would typically do Jesus doesn't do that okay and so he is not trying to go around to avoid the Samaritans and he certainly is not trying to avoid this type of woman that I would say a people in her time would. I want to also point this out that, uh, uh, by the way, it's said to be a shortage of Samaritan women today for the Samaritan men. Um, basically, this is a population that's becoming more. Um, extinct and there aren't a lot of people and I got this 
a quote and I will let you know where you can find out more about this. So, the Samaritans survived a centuries of war and slavery. Today they face a new challenge too. Too many men. <laughs> and you can look at this. This was written by uh, Tom Joyner, J-O-Y-N-E-R, in the West Bank, and it's uh, uh, dated uh, July 2021. Uh, so if you are really interested in knowing more about this particular group and the Samaritans and their history, I just want to make that out there and available to you if you don't already know. Uh, maybe those that are living more in the region of the Southern Levant, uh, you know about it. It's around your uh, societies and you know the history better than some of us may know it here in the US so now let's get into the Bible let's get into the Bible st. John verse 7 when a Samaritan woman came to draw water Jesus said to her will you give me a drink this is a uh, this is a very special verse for me in of the Bible because of the way Jesus approaches her immediately and he interacts with her like like you know he's he's not looking down on her will you give me a drink verse 9 you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman how can you ask me for a drink so you know she immediately is identifying the differences she is Embracing her identity, her label, her tag, and she is making, she is really distinguishing herself from Jesus. And she's doing it in a historical way because of the history, in an ethnic way, right? Um, it is also social. And it is also religious. So she is making that distinction. I mean, Jesus gives her a very open and welcoming approach. But she stands off. Because she's very aware of where she belongs in that society. And her identity. And you see, even now when Jesus knocks on the door of our hearts. There are times because of our own history, our religious way of seeing things, what we've been told in life, our family history, is that we automatically be put up a wall and say, Jesus, why are you coming to encounter with me? Why are you interacting? Why are you inviting me to have a conversation with you. Don't you know my history? Don't you know how I live? Don't you know what I've been doing in the last couple of weeks? Don't you know about all of my say substance abuse? So Jesus steps right in, doesn't pay attention to the religious protocol or the type of woman that she is. I mean, it's really something for Jesus to be talking to a woman in this day, but also this type of woman. Let's find out more. She's pointing out to Jesus what she expected for, from him. So, I mean, and you know, we, this is a, to me, this is a, a form of projection. We project onto a people a lot of times uh, what we think of ourselves that why aren't they feeling the same way. So we can project, you know, rejection. And um, she's saying, you know, what she really expected was this. Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I mean, this is the history. This is the society. This is the culture. This happens to all of us. We have all you no. Know, we are living in this world, and all different you know, races and backgrounds and cultures. And so we know, even within certain tribes and certain parts of the world, you just don't associate with someone else in that tribe. So this is all 
our common language and living situations of today. So, verse 10, if this is now Jesus, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, he would have given you living water. If you only knew who you were talking to, she doesn't really know yet. She doesn't know. If you only knew. A lot of times when the Lord comes to, to a person who has been living a certain type of lifestyle where they know that those who are religious would say, get out of here. Don't come near us. You're filthy. You are destructive. And then, you know, the Lord says, hey, Kevin, hey, David, hey, Priscilla, come here. Let's talk. This talk is like, you are going to spend time talking to me? Do you know what I just did? Jesus is saying, no. If you knew who I was, if you only knew, you would ask me for living water. But you see, she doesn't know. She doesn't know yet. You have nothing to draw with. This is her response. I'm paraphrasing some. Not entirely, but some. Um, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? So she's smart. She's, she's, she's practical. She's asking, no, Jesus, a good question. You don't have anything to draw from. So, I mean, like, you know, how, how can you help me with this? Where can you get this you know, living water? I, I, I imagine she's thinking this is something mystical, magical, powerful that she doesn't really yet really know about from this man and y your wait okay so I'm sorry she says are you greater than our father Jacob she knows her roots she knows her heritage she knows who she is linked to she believes in the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob this is a religious woman at the well. Yes. Who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock. She's going back into, okay, this history regarding his sons and Jacob and Joseph. She knows her history and her roots. Okay, say that she believes in Jacob's God as her own. Verse 13. Jesus, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. And this is so popular in the Christian community. And we love this. We love to hear Jesus say, Okay, you can drink from this water, but you will thirst again. Sometimes we can read more into this than what it actually is. But I do understand how this is applied a lot to our practical way of living. That we are thirsty in life. That we go after things. We try to quench the thirst with so many things. With relationships. With you know, career and money, right, and our, and our pride and our arrogance. And so we, we see it at times that we are constantly, okay, conditioned to go after things to quench your inner thirst that never gets really quenched in doing these things. And that is absolutely true because why? We have all experienced that, right? Whether we admit it or not, we have tried things that doesn't really fill us up like we thought that they would. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. This is linked to salvation, but remember, and the life in the Holy Spirit, but Jesus has not been crucified yet and resurrected. So, the truth is, though, you would need faith in Jesus, okay, if this was to take place in you. And let's refer 
to Jeremiah 2.13. This is the Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was a prophet of the Lord and his day. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So when I look at this, okay, I want to make this applicable and yeah I do want to tap into our emotions some as people we have also carried around our brokenness and tried to fill ourselves with all kinds of waters there's more than one type of water too many substitutes if you notice that when you drink water water is water nothing else can suffice but having me try, especially, I know I've done some, say, workouts. I try those flavor type of waters. I try salsa water. I want to add even some lemon to my water because sometimes I don't want to just have regular water. But if I'm really honest with myself, and I think if you are too, if you're really thirsty and you're in great need of water, we know that waters with the substitutes added, Sweet water, right? Lemon water, salsa water. It isn't like true water, like real pure spring water. There's a difference. So we can go through life and we can try and substitute ourselves with water, but f even fake type of water. But it's not going to work. Or we can go out and think that we can do this and we can do that. And we can fill this void that must be filled in our spirit. So you see, I love to think about this also in that way. But this a water is also referring to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that was promised that will also come. But remember... Jesus has not died yet and been resurrected. So here's a question too. Is he telling her about what is to come? Is this also a foreshadowing? And in a way, yes, it is. He knows who she is, the kind of woman that she is. Yes, she is a Samaritan. Yes, she can trace her history back to Jacob. Yes, she believes in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, she is also religious. But she also has in her life, it appears, some brokenness, like we all have, have had, and have from time to time, and will have again. Jesus was going to be more than about water. This isn't just about the water in the well. It isn't just about that. It isn't just about, you know, say, Jacob's well. Yeah, this will quench her thirst, naturally. She was used to that. We all need that. We all need our thirst to be quenched naturally. And nothing is like really true water. But she would thirst again. And we can say in a, in a way to make this more applicable to our lives. Just in practical terms. You drink soda. You drink ice coffee. You drink sweet water. Salsa water. You'll thirst again. That's just really physical. But also trying to fill our thirst with, with things, with you know, relationships, with things in the world, with material things. We know we will thirst again because we get bored. I go out and I buy a brand new dress and after I've worn it a couple of times, it's in the back of the closet and that relationship is over. <laughs> I'm ready for a new one. That's right. So what, is, what can be replaced? How can we replace with anything the living water that Jesus has for her? Jesus is not very concerned about what she may think that he is concerned about. He is telling her who he is and what is to come. Jesus will leave this uh, woman. And with this encounter, she will never be the same. Remember again that Jesus was not yet crucified and he wasn't yet glorified. 
but he represented the spring of living water. And also, if you do this in deeper say, research, it also can refer to baptism. Once accepting a Jesus, we take a baptism of being submerged in water and raised up. And that symbolizes a new identity with the death of, of Christ, but also now with the resurrection, with the life of Christ. Also a commitment, a marriage to serve God for the rest of our lives. And this is what is on its way at this particular time when he is speaking to this woman. Jesus knows who he is. He knows his mission. He's aware that she doesn't know all that he is. She has an eye there. She sees him in a certain way, and we will get into that. So John 7, Jesus announces in John uh, or the seventh chapter, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we can also relate that to the rivers of living water. The presence, the cleansing presence and the refreshment and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You can read that more in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. Jesus is saying all that he is represents why he is here and what is to come. He makes a very, you know, simple statement it seems. But that's a heavy loaded statement about him being the living water. You see, let me go back and get to that verse. That's a heavy loaded statement. Um, if you had known, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This is heavy. This is, this is what is coming, and this is his purpose. This is Jesus, I would say, if you had to give Jesus a purpose statement, this is a purpose statement. This is the purpose statement of Jesus' mission, and why he's even spending time with this woman. He's introducing not only who he is now, but what is to come. What is to come as well. Verse 16. Now. Jesus gets a little personal. He's given his introduction. Now. He gets a little into her life. Go call your husband. And come back. This is a touchy subject. I have no husband. Verse 17. Verse 18. You are right. When you say you have no husband, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. Okay. Okay. So, here we go. And I know for us out there, as women, you know, this has been really a comforting to a lot of us in times when we have felt you know rejection just for being a woman and but now to add to that her lifestyle and you know this is about so is this about a character issue in a way it is but this isn't the theme of this yeah she's got no different men in a way this was about her character a particular type of woman that she is but it's about something also deeper than that why she is in need of this living water like all of us we are no different than the woman at the well because you see I look at it too is that this is about a woman who this is a matter of unfulfillment longing for love and acceptance feeling like an outcast she couldn't do any better than what she was actually uh, doing, or she got used to being used. So maybe there are issues of insecurity. 
I believe she was looking for love, but it wasn't really, say, happening. That that satisfaction wasn't coming. That I don't blame her entirely for not getting that satisfaction. It's also about the ones that she was involved in. Were these men selfish? Were they just really, say, using her? I believe that she longed for that connection as most uh, uh, people do, man or a woman. But it's not working. It's just not happening because she's gone through a few times now. So, I think it's much more about than just identifying her with a flawed character. Her lifestyle was no surprise to Jesus. Nor did it keep him away from her. Her being a woman didn't keep him away from her. Her being a Samaritan didn't keep him away from her. He wasn't going to abide by another classism. And her lifestyle didn't keep him away from her. Her flawed character did not keep him away. Because though he was a Jew, he was different. This is Jesus we're talking about. Who is a Jesus today is who Jesus was then at the well with this Samaritan woman. He's on a purposeful mission. It isn't just about ethnicity, language, okay? Class, how she looks, who she's been with. Verse 21. Now she is going to kind of try and wrap this up and say, Okay, I, I know who you are. I can see that you are a prophet. Yes, Jesus does function. I'm saying this now. Jesus does function in the prophetic, but he isn't only a prophet. And that's really proven. He'll point that out. Neither does he identify himself in that way. He tells her that he can give her living water. Okay, that he has the living water. That's a statement of authority. That's saying, <laughs> I, uh, I'm aware of who you are, but I know what you need. Well, what, what she needs is what I need. And what you need out there. I needed what, what she needed then. I need it now. I will always need it. The living water. He can give her living water. He speaks with an authority that he can give her something that no one else can. Not the men, but also not the religion. Jesus is on a mission to the cross, to die on the cross. This hasn't happened yet. So is he also speaking about what is to come? Yes. She also refers to her ancestors way of worshiping. She refers to the fact that they worship on that particular mountain where they were meeting. But now we have some kind of controversial a situation here. She identifies how her ancestors, they worship on that mountain. And this is true. But the Jews claim that the place where we must say worship is in Jerusalem. Now, what is, I had to find out too, I mean, I read it, but I wanted to do say some research. What is of the mountain that she is referring to? It's the mountain called, it's called Gersism. Wait, Gersism. Ger <laughs> I got, sometimes with, that, with my New York uh, accent, the R's become challenging. But when I say things in Spanish, I can say R very well. Like, arroz, arroz, perros, perrita. But when I say it in English, <laughs> I struggle. Okay, so the mountain, G-E-R-I-Z-I-M. Okay, that is uh, one of the highest peaks in the West Bank. And for the Samaritans, this is considered the holiest place on earth. Okay? So, upon 
entering the promised land after the exodus, the Israelites performed ceremonies as they had been told to do by their leader Moses. So this is a special place for the Samaritans and she wants to point that out. But aha, uh -huh, the Jews say we need to worship in Jerusalem. But look how the Lord takes care of this. The Samaritans, they consider this to be a sacred place. Okay? Now, Jerusalem's temple, mountain, it's between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. So that's the other place. This, by the way, is considered a holy city for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And you can look into that more if you're not already familiar with that. So she is, you know, she, she is really very stuck into her way of thinking as well. But she is aware that someone was to come called the Messiah. Let's go to verse 21. This is how the Lord replies, Jesus. Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the, in, in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Powerful. Jesus says, okay, we're getting this all straight, okay? You got a mountain, okay? You're calling this the place that's holy. This is where we should really worship. Okay, but other Jews say, you know, we should worship there. In Jerusalem. I'll say it again. Jesus, he, he replies. There's a time coming when you will worship the Father. Neither on this mountain. So it's not about the mountain. It's not about the region. Nor in Jerusalem. This, neither of these say places are going to put you in a right standing with God. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. And I mean, this is like a strong statement. You're like, you know, you, 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 just, you just don't know. You don't really know what you are saying, ma'am. But let me tell you and explain to you that the God that you call Father, Father God, what he really is demanding of his people. We worship, you worship what you do not know, for salvation is from the Jews. Well, Jesus is a Jew, okay? Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, in other words, you see, as I've said in some other videos the Lord stamps and chooses a particular people in the region of Israel and I believe they will I believe there were of different um, backgrounds and shades of skin but what makes them unique and separated and called out and sealed is that they are going to be a group of people that believe in the God of Abraham Isaac and and Jacob, a monotheistic God that they will believe in and call on. And so now they will become those that will demonstrate and manifest this plan called salvation. So, yes, salvation is from the Jews because as we go back, the Lord called out a people group. And that was those, it was based on their belief systems, I will always say, and not about how they look. Now, this woman, she's a part of this, but she's a sec. You know, 
a different sect. And that uh, happens in all of our different groups of people that we are from a particular region, we belong to a particular group, but because of wars or conflict and history, misunderstandings, that we become a separate branch. But it still all goes back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is the God that this woman at the well says she believes in. She's a religious woman too. So let's go to verse 25, how she responds. I know that Messiah is coming, called Christ. I know that Messiah is coming. She knows. How can she not? She's been told. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. So she doesn't yet see a Jesus as the Messiah. I think she likes Jesus. She thinks he's maybe a very nice uh, man. You know, he spent time with her. This wasn't supposed to really happen. Uh, she's of a different sect. You know, she's a Samaritan. She's got a not so favorable way of living. You know, uh, she, she's struggling with her relationships. And so, you know, Jesus takes out, he takes, he takes the time of day. Okay. And, uh, but he has to, he's got to let her know the truth. Jesus has to self-identify now. Verse 26, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Okay, I'm he. I'm the Messiah. This is, you know, this is his self-identification here. He's letting her know. He's, he's letting her know after this conversation. Okay, me. <laughs> okay, me, why? This is, this, is, this is who you're talking to, okay? Everyone out there. Whatever you believe, and basically, if you are if you are familiar with some of these, say regions and cultures, even of today, this encounter wasn't supposed to happen, based on the prejudices, the classism, and the religiosity of the day. Okay, her lifestyle, who she, what she represents, who she represents, rather. And even the disciples are wondering what's going on. You know why? There's proof. So, first of all, this is Jesus, the Son of God. She's a Samaritan and not such a maybe nice girl. This conversation breaks the rules. It breaks the protocol. But that's what... Jesus is really good at. If you say, who is Jesus today? Well, he breaks the rules. He breaks the protocols. He breaks the religious rules. Verse 27, his disciples returned and were surprised that he was talking to a woman. So there you go. We are dealing with issues here of culture of the day. But there are parts of the world where some of this is still in place. Verse 29, Come see. Now, this is like the woman, because this woman has changed now. She had an, an encounter, and I believe that she's convinced, too. Now, who is this man who was talking to me? This is Jesus. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward her. She now becomes like this evangelist, you see? This is the, 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 the this wasn't supposed to happen, but Jesus, he knows. He, he has a plan. He's got a, a, a purpose and a mission. Even his own disciples are, are, are they, they are pointing out, you, you know, you were talking to a woman. <laughs> you're talking to a woman. Jesus, you're talking to a woman. Okay. Jesus. Now, the disciples were really hungry. They had, they had went for food. When I look at this, I think about I thought about this with my sometimes with my crazy self here, you know, I said, well, you know, for my hometown back in New York, I'm thinking they went for some food. Did they, like, they find like some, you know, little bodegas, you know, you get like, um, I don't know, a fish sandwich. Let's put it that way. Fish sandwich and some juice. <laughs> okay, 
uh, I doubt there was any bag of chips, but I'm just saying, you know, I'm thinking about it like, you know, here in our time, you go to the corner store and you, you go to the bodegas because you're hungry. So anyway, they came back, they had, they had some food. Verse 34, Jesus says, my food, okay, this is what Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me. To finish his work. Enjoy your food. I'm just going to paraphrase some. Put it in the 21st century. Enjoy your food. Enjoy your snacks. How about some of you who. You're on God's mission. God told you today. You know not to eat but to pray. But the people that are working with you. They're starving. You're out, on a, you're, you're out in the streets doing some outreach. They got to take a break. We got we to gotta find a bodega. Okay. We're hungry. Okay, tengo hambre. And the Lord just goes off and, and or you, <laughs> and you spend time and say, no, you see that person over there on that step? I got to pray for them. That's going to be my food. That's going to be my food right now. Yeah, I feel the hunger, but you know what? Instead of me going off to the stores with you, I, I, I have to stop. I have to pray for this particular person. You see? Because when you're on a mission... And when you commit it to that purpose, that mission, you cannot be deterred. Jesus wasn't going to be deterred. This encounter with this woman, I believe, is in uh, the Bible for a few reasons. I'm speculating now. And I know it's been taught so well how the Lord just has love and compassion for, you know, women, regardless of their uh, background their choices, how they look, that the Lord, he stops, he spends time with you when no one else will. And this was an encounter that wasn't supposed to normally take place, but I'm glad that it did. I'm glad that it's in the Bible. What about you? There's a lot to learn and to take in from it and to be blessed. And we learned a lot about who is Jesus today when he confronts women that society has also called an outcast or written off or when he confronts a people in a particular ethnic group that it is really popular to hang out with for whatever reasons within that society or that you know he just lets you know that you know you you are talking about something but you don't really know what you are talking about okay and he lets her know he identifies and says I am he I am the same Messiah that you heard about that was coming I am the promise I am he I am here and this is why he can take the authority and say I have the living water I have what you need I'm on a mission that will make that possible now it will be possible as it was spoken in the Old Testament by the prophets there's coming living water and to make this say applicable in our lives and our daily situations we always need the living water of the Holy Spirit we always need to be refreshed in the Holy Spirit we don't need the substitutes in the same way in the physical substituting say water doesn't help us and even we can go and buy something it says water but it's got some raspberry flavor in there okay and f and food coloring is it really water it's not it's a substitute so everyone out there in the world and girls and sisters in Christ this is the end of this long message uh, it was more or less like a teaching a journey of walking through John chapter 4 coming from a different say angle um, than some that I have heard myself but yet I have also been able to pick up from others things too because no one person has the full understanding or counsel of God so I have I have learned a lot also from some wonderful teaching and I just wanted to share that today and come from a different perspective but this is the Word of God Jesus is the living water there's no substitute in this particular 
book, he is referring to he can give her the living water. But this is also about the mission that Christ is on. He had yet to be glorified. But as we search out the scriptures, there's also a promise of the Holy Spirit that comes to refresh us, to renew us, to bring us into sanctification. So God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is all one, working, working. It's this just really one mission. And that is to bring us out of exile and back into relationship with the Father the way we began in the garden. I hope this today blesses you. It's just maybe a lot to say digest for some, but you have now the liberty to listen to it and to go through it and to search the scriptures for yourself. Wherever you are today on your journey, if you have another religion or if you feel like you don't want any religion at all, I still want to say I respect you and thank you for taking out the time to even listen to some of what I said today. And in much love, I want to extend to you today God's love for you. doesn't matter who you are or where you are, Jesus has time for you. That's who Jesus is today. And until next time, Shalom.